Welcome to Artificially Intelligent Marketing, a weekly podcast where we stay on top of the latest trends, tips, and tools in the world of marketing AI, helping you get the best results from your marketing efforts. Now let's join our hosts, Paul Avery and Martin Broadhurst. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode nine of Artificially Intelligent Marketing, that we're glad that you're here with us today. There's lots and lots of stuff for us to get through. Um, We're going to look at some top stories where we're going to go into some depth. So today we're going to cover the EU's proposed new copyright laws for AI. Very important for marketers to know what's going on there. We're going to look at OpenAI's um, release of Code Interpreter as a uh, chat GPT plugin. That's pretty cool as well. Stability uh, AI announcing Deep Floyd IF. It's text to image generation with text tool. Um, We're going to look at um, tool of the week and we're going to look at the Bing sidebar on that one um, and we're also going to look at a few other things that interested us like this anime movie trailer that someone made with Runway's Gen 2 text video tool which was pretty cool. Outside of that there was a bunch of other stuff that happened this week that we won't have time to go into detail about but that we did still want to cover briefly on the podcast so we're going to call these short snippets and we're going to look at some of those very quickly before we get into the big stories of the week. Um I'm going to crack through these, Martin, and if there's a particular one that you want to chime in on, jump in and let us know what your thoughts are. Um, the first one was ChatGPT is now allowed to operate in Italy again after introducing a number of privacy disclosures and controls in there. So that's back in play. Uh, Anthropic raises $580 million in their Series B, which is further evidence of all the cash that continues to flood into the AI company space. Tech layoffs continue with Dropbox laying off 16% of people um, in its team and IBM, as we saw today, pausing hiring. Um, And much of these layoffs are reported to be driven by augmenting existing staff with AI, although none of the companies are actually confirming this. And I guess in many ways it could be driven by some of the economic challenges in the market. But this is what people are thinking are are happening is that AI is going to start to play a bigger role in the workforces of some of these companies. What are your thoughts on this one, Mike? I know you had some thoughts. Well, it's a continuation of those tech layoffs that we've seen over the past 12 months or so. But this one is particularly interesting that the IBM one, um, talking or commentators around the issue were saying that, yeah, this is AI. And what they're looking to do is basically replace jobs that were more or less kind of filing paperwork or moving data from one place to another quite you know back office jobs kind of admin jobs they're the kind of roles that they're looking to replace and these will be automated using ai ml technology so i think it's interesting to see whether those jobs are fully replaced you know sometimes we see big tech companies make huge rounds of layoffs and then before you know it they're rehiring people again so it was you know a bit of a a fool's errand to to go and do that in the first place but uh, yeah if they are jobs that are lost for good that's we're certainly starting to see the the thin end of the wedge uh, for ai job replacement i don't think jobs are going to be replaced overnight but uh, we're starting to see it creep in it did make me think about another topic that we uh, well, we covered this topic on a recent episode, looking at the OpenAI report on um, disruption in the labor market through GPT technology. And I brought to mind an article that I read this week, which looked at uh, a study that was done where healthcare professionals were asked to judge the responses to patient emails and the they were shown two responses. One of the responses was from a real healthcare professional responding to the the patient and their inquiry. And the other was a response written by Chad GPT and GPT-4. Now the healthcare assessor, as it were, didn't know which was which. So this, these were blind tests. And in 79% of cases, they rated Chat GPT's response as being the better in, uh, the better response in terms of higher quality in terms of the information provided and having a better understanding and higher empathy which is fascinating to me so we're starting to see 
uh, real world uh, peer reviewed or, or at least um, you know assessments done by people that know what they're talking about looking at outputs from humans versus robots and saying the AI is as good or better in this case better nearly four fifths of the time wow I saw that story I had not taken home the empathy part right if you're a blind assessor and it could be a human you see empathy in it it would be fascinating to run that experiment again where it was unblinded and would knowing it was a robot change someone's interpretation of the empathy a that would be interesting b does it matter and would this therefore make an argument for not telling people when they're getting certain types of support by a robot almost as part of a placebo effect right it's like for, for mental health support we so talked about this a bit on the podcast previously oh. rating the the large language model was being more empathetic than the humans that's a little bit of mind blowing cool thank you for sharing that one mine um one this last quick snippet um i saw a graphic this week martin showing the evolution of mid journey from version one to version five and the quality of the images and the improvement especially in the photo realism of the images and getting some rid of some of the junk that told you it was a, a an ai image like hands that had 42 fingers and stuff like that um and that's kind of mind-blowing because version one was launched just over a year ago and the rumors are that version six is probably going to come out in the next month or two which would be in line with the release schedule around mid journey so far so the, it, we we talk a lot on this podcast about the pace of change you just have to look at if you can find online anyone just google and find those graphics that show the comparison from v1 to v5 yikes like where will we be in six to twelve months the the pace of change is astonishing on the way back from a, a client meeting this afternoon i was watching a youtube video um i highly recommend everyone go and check it out it's uh, the title is the ai dilemma and it was filmed at a san francisco event on march the 9th and it's had 1.3 million views already and basically it's um two of the journalists or well whoever it was the people that put together the netflix film the social dilemma uh -huh. and they're now looking at ai and kind of presenting where ai is now i should say this came out or this talk was done before gpt4 was announced right and in that they talk about um basically the whole theme is ai poses a catastrophic risk to humanity which is a recurring theme i'm feeling <laughs> every week we have to have the dooms uh do the, the naysayers, the doomsayers, call it what you will. But actually, one of the things that they talk about in this is um, we're hitting double exponential territory in terms of the capabilities of AI. And they said it's really hard for people to grasp quite what that means. And they said even people that are working in AI, ML research day in, day out, even though they you know, rationally understand what exponential growth and exponential capabilities of development, they, they understand what it means. They struggle to bring that into the kind of reality. So they give an example of AI experts that were asked to, um, to say when they thought AI would be capable of um, more than 50% of the time being able to answer competitive maths questions so like real high level cutting edge leading edge maths like competition level maths questions and they got it wrong by years they said they said uh, i think it was in the they thought it was going to be four years that was it and it was actually one year and from from when the survey was done and then they're now saying so this was a few years ago they're now saying that uh, the AI capability is beating the questions quicker than they can really be written like uh, 80 90 percent of the time this is and we're seeing this kind of in the real world we're seeing this happen in real time in front of us and, and all of the products that we're using day to day this growth in capabilities mid-journey as you say um, the transition from one to five to six around the corner 
is is breathtaking and kind of exciting frightening i'm glad yeah i would agree with it in that order um but i definitely yeah we've talked ad infinitum about the risks of ai and some of the other things that we try not to go into too much detail on this podcast although they should absolutely be be recognized yeah it's so there's a, a guy i don't know if you know him I'm called um, peter diamandis and he's like a futurist to a certain extent but he's like he's got a, a phd in in some biological discipline he is a medical doctor he founded the x prize i don't know if you've heard of the x prize um and um he is an investor uh in a number of different companies in a number of different areas but his whole thing is about um basically the exponential change in a number of areas in the world drifting towards a world of abundance because he's very positive about the future he's got a podcast called moonshots and mindsets people should look that up it's really really interesting but he always talks about how our brains are linear uh. right we count the thing that our brains are organized and evolved to count the things in front of us right four trees over there in that forest 16 trees over there in that forest 32 stones on the floor we cannot imagine exponential change because you don't easily see it in front of you in nature in terms of macro scale right like just looking you know you could probably observe exponential division of cells but even that happens over a time period that's quite hard for a human to sit and watch like you'd have to time lapse it you need a microscope and so yeah it's it's a it's a funny old world and it makes it hard to imagine because the other thing is we should also still remember that humans have been very good at like predicting we'd have flying cars by like 1999 in the 60s and stuff like this so we're also we're, we're both simultaneously spectacularly overly optimistic and yet for certain changes, unable to comprehend how fast they're going to move. It's fascinating. I guess that's what keeps all the futurists in work. But um, yeah, let's move on to the actual bigger stories of the week. The first one is e the EU's proposed new copyright laws for AI. And for all of you working in marketing who are thinking about using generative AI tools to produce content and images and other things for your brand, understanding the copyright landscape is critical tell us a bit about what you learned from this story recent story mine this is a, a big development and we have covered the regulation changes and the ai act that the eu has been bringing out um for a while now it's been in the works for uh, i think a couple of years and it's the eu commission's attempt at addressing ai technology regulation and one of the things that to date they've um had in the in the regulation is that tools needed to have where ai or ml technology was being used it had to have some sort of risk classification so it would have to say high risk low risk medium risk so for instance if it was like spam detection on emails it would be low risk and if it was you know saying who can get healthcare insurance that would be high risk those kinds of things um, but this new development in the regulation has been brought about specifically in response to generative AI. And uh, it addresses the big topic of copyright. So as we know, training data for large language models and text to image generators and all of these kind of technologies consumes lots of copyright data. They crawl the web, they watch lots of video, they you know, we've, we've seen stability and stable diffusion, uh, creating image with shutter stock, uh, watermarks all over them. So, so we know that it is doing that. And what the EU is now saying is that where models have been trained using copyright data, the people who have produced the model or have trained the model have to disclose that as part of the, um, well, just as they just have to disclose that. Uh, this is an interesting solution given where they could have landed uh, because there were some people that were calling for an outright ban and until these um, tools can be sorted out uh, some of the more extreme voices were saying that they should just uh, ban it completely and this is seen as being a more uh, moderating uh, 
approach and I, I think it's a it serves the good middle ground i certainly think from a um from a marketer's perspective or a content producer or a content creator's perspective if we're we need to start thinking a bit more like wired so wired magazines um publication about how they're using generative ai I spoke about that they're, they're not that's about exactly how they are going to use it and one of the things they said for text to image generation was they're not going to use it um, until the copyright issue is resolved. Now, all of a sudden, we can start to see that, well, actually, the copyright issue is going to be a real differentiator for people using a model or not. If, if Wired magazine are saying, well, we're not going to use models that have been trained on copyright data, a tool like Adobe's Firefly, which has as one of its leading value propositions, we are not training our models on copyrighted data, well, that becomes a real sell because you think, oh, well, I'll use that and I'm not at risk of, of ripping anybody off. So that becomes uh, a competitive advantage for people that are creating these models that aren't trained on um, copyrighted data, which leads you to think that the likes of Shutterstock, the likes of um, Getty Images, the likes of Adobe, who have access to huge amounts of um, these kind of data sets that are that they own yeah um, big image repositories a, and stuff yeah yeah that they, they will be able to uh to create the the better more compliant models uh, in the future yeah it's um it's inter it's, it's absolutely fascinating i think i can imagine a world where certainly the bigger brands almost have to lean into those types of tools it's just not worth their time to get caught up in any of these copyright issues my experience playing with and reading about and looking at the ones that are trained on data that's owned by like Shutterstock Images or Adobe um, is that they are limited in comparison. Um, I think I saw online an example where someone was trying to create some interesting images with Deadpool. And of course, I don't know, I think I think it was Adobe Firefly. Basically, it couldn't. It didn't know what Deadpool was because that's a, that's a you know, a an owned likeness um, by Disney at this point, I would guess. Um, and so it couldn't be in the training set, right? But of course, those that are using images from here, there and everywhere could do it. So I could imagine a world in which smaller businesses that were willing to risk it could probably create quite maybe higher quality potentially as well images, but that's the risk that they're taking, whereas bigger brands probably lean into the into these types of images we've talked previously how will this end up probably a little bit like spotify like some type of mechanism where everybody whose image was used in the training data set gets 0.0000000001 pence every time someone gen generates an image and there's some sort of fees that come out the back of it i i still think we may see something like that to be honest did, did you see the grimes updates hey, tell us about it so yeah the the grimes uh I, I don't really i'm, I'm not even going to pretend to really know who grimes is other than they're i think a pop star i sound so old <laughs> they make the popular music yeah. that goes into the hit parade i think mm -hmm. she has i think i think they're on singles. the wireless <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> you can get them on the cd single and uh is, a, is Grimes married to Elon Musk? Is that the right? I think was person was oh, hard to keep up. Um, so yeah, Grimes has said that feel free to make music using AI versions of Grimes's voice. Absolutely, go wild, and Grimes will share any revenue with you fifty fifty. It's very interesting approach and i think very smart because if she doesn't have to do any you know or they don't have to do any work then and then they made the revenue and also the person who did the work gets some revenue uh, yeah absolutely fascinating how some of these innovative business models come about is going to be fascinating and i would i really want to keep an eye on the early movers who put themselves out there and say things like that because i think i think it will be fascinating to see how it plays out um yeah good story thanks for flagging that one for us mine 
Story number two is OpenAI has made a new plugin available called Code Interpreter through ChatGPT. So for those that are on the wait list, like me, still waiting to get access to plugins, please give me access to plugins so I can have a play. I could tell all the lovely people who um, listen to this podcast and give them the absolute um, honest review of just how good or not they are, because I read that they're good at times and still really buggy at other times. Um, this new one is making a few waves this week because it allows you to analyze and interpret data. So I've seen some reports suggesting it can deliver the same sort of value as a junior level data analyst. The inference being it could replace a junior level data analyst. The way that it works is you upload a data file via CSV um, and then you ask for trends insights uh, on the data you can get it to plot things for you and all of this is driven by natural language prompts so a lot of tools have been promising some level of automation and ai and the ability to do data analysis without having to be a coder but actually you still needed to know how to manipulate sql and all this other stuff whereas with this plugin it's natural language you upload it you ask a question of the data and you get an answer. You can ask it to provide you with a report. I saw an example where someone basically asked Code Interpreter to pull out what it thought was two or three key trends from a large bulk of data, and then write an abstract for the paper that would they would draft based on it. And then I think also, they I think they even drafted the paper using ChatGPT as well. So this is absolutely fascinating why is it important for marketers well fundamentally it makes it easier for marketers many of us don't know and we certainly don't how to manipulate data using sql and other fancy techniques so it could bring that to non-developer marketers which i think is really uh, interesting and i think making data analysis open and accessible like this is especially powerful for small and mid-sized businesses that would never have perhaps interrogated their data in this way, right? If you don't have a, a data analysis team because you're a small or mid-sized company, you just don't do it. And that's been my experience anyway, because you don't have the bandwidth anyway, because you've got a hundred other things to do and you don't have the expertise in the business. But now, if you can basically outsource that to the level of junior data an analyst in chat GPT with this plugin, you can start to surface insights in your data that you might not have otherwise um so that's pretty cool i think the one caveat that springs instantly to mind is the caveat of chat chat gpt forever and ever and ever which is will it hallucinate will it report trends that weren't there um if it's only able to perform at a certain level it's best piloted this has been my experience with chat gpt at least by someone who has more insight than the tool right you ask it to put together 10 points for a blog post on a particular topic you need to be an expert yourself in the topic to make sure that those 10 points are all accurate and relevant and interesting and that it's not full of hallucinations and junk and i could imagine that could end up being the case here so the reality is it might help senior data analysts get more done and it might not quite open up the power to non-developer data analyst people potentially but yeah so i thought that was fascinating any thoughts on this one I think actually using it as a non-data analyst will be a bit of a stretch for, for a lot of people um, for the reasons that you've identified, but I think you don't know what you don't know. That's the issue. So you can stick a load of data in and be like, tell me some things or produce some interesting graphs. But when I was, uh, this sprung to mind when I was reading a thread, I've got, in fact, I've got a Twitter thread open now and it says, um, it, where is it? So creating charts to basic video editing to converting files, it does it all. Basic video editing. What? How does that even work? I don't even understand how that makes sense. But that's just demonstrating my lack of knowledge about what a tool like this should be able to do. It goes on to give some really interesting visualizations that it does, plotting onto maps and kind of showing geographic data and spatial analysis and all sorts of kind of cool things. But if you're not a data analyst, you don't know what graph to, you're probably talking about, give me a pie chart. Yeah. Give me a pie chart. Give me a bar chart. Whereas this thing, 
is laughing at your ineptitude when you ask it to give you a basic pie chart. Um, <laughs> I think you're right. You know, one of the things I've noticed as I've got old uh, is smart people ask great questions. And if you don't know what great questions to ask of your data, then the insights are going to be, you're not going to access them, right? And the ability, I mean, the example I mentioned did see ChatGPT's code interpreter try and pull insights from the data by asking itself questions about the data. Um, but obviously, some people have reported that it's more like a junior analyst. So one assumes its ability to ask great questions and great follow-up questions, right? It's like, they always say like, they are, who's they? Um, one thing I always think about is if you really want to get to the nub of a subject, there's like models like the five whys, right? It's, ne oh. it's not the first yeah. question where the real interesting stuff is. It's, okay, well, what drove that? And, and what drove that? And what are the underlying factors of that? And oh, then you get something interesting. So, yeah, can these tools really do that? I think you're right, mine. I think that's where experts piloting the machines are still going to be super valuable. I think you're absolutely bang on. Right, let's get ourselves on to story number three, which is Stability AI have announced Deep Floyd IF, which is a text -im image generation tool, but it actually produces nice text, which has obviously been a major bugbear of most of the tools available so far. Tell us about this one, mine. Yeah, so the only one that I'd seen do this before, the only text-to-image generation model I'd seen produce text was the research paper that Google published with Google Party last year. They announced it just after they announced Google Imaging. And that was a huge data set. It was a massive amount of parameters. It was, I think it was like 20 billion or something which is far, far greater than, than the others. But Stability AI have released a Deep Floyd IF, a state-of-the-art text-to-image model that generates high-quality images from text prompts. So it uses the same uh, underlying interface. So we, we're all familiar with it. You write in some words and you get an image. Um, incredible abilities with photorealism. Uh, and it can generate in different aspect ratios, um, and the text generation on it, so there's a couple of interesting examples with shop signage and graffiti and things like that, is incredible. Now, when you look at it, it's a different model to, or it's a different text generation style to um, the diffusion models that we've seen to date. That's the, the technology, the, the way the model creates the image was, was through diffusion, hence stable diffusion uh, on the previous model. With this one, it creates um, a 64 by 64 pixel image and then kind of upscales it from there. And it's a really interesting approach. To completely reading the paper, I mean, it gets far more technical than my small brain can handle. But just seeing a different approach to image generation uh, was quite fascinating to understand how you can get text created it's much easier to create text when you kind of scale it down to 64 by 64 pixels and then expand out um from there so yeah an another interesting model for marketers to look at because this is really going to let's be honest we've all been itching for the moment we can create images with real text in them uh, it's been one of the things holding back text to image from being something that's kind of truly uh, useful in a lot of instances um, text was always one of those things that was an artifact that you would spot straight away. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we can see good, high quality um, images. Potentially uh, seeing this being integrated into tools like Canva, that would be very interesting for marketers to get their hands on it, not having to kind of, well, as with all of these kind of tools, you want a good UI. You want a, a nice, easy way to interface with it. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Stability AI implement it within ClipDrop. That was the tool of the week from a recent episode. Uh, I would expect them to make it nice and uh, easy for people to use from there. Obviously, as with all of these things that we're seeing, new models uh, that are just 
bigger, better, more capable. This increases the risk of potential disinformation and fake news. But I think we've always had fake news problems anyway, and the same methods for filtering images, the same sense checks, the same fact checking, the same general um, common sense levels of discernment that we should bring to any media we see online should apply uh, anyway. And whether it's a new text to image model or just a Photoshop image, these the risks always present themselves. So I don't think that's too much of a of a concern. But uh, yeah, I've I don't have you had a look at any of the images? Have you? Yeah, I've I've had I've had a bit of a play with it, and it's kind of for all the reasons you just said. It's actually kind of fascinating to use because obviously you start with um, a really small image that looks blurry, and then you upscale it, and you and the upscale actually looks good. Like in a lot of the cases when I've played with it, not many artifacts. Although I'm sure it's probably quite easy to get artifacts, and I'm sure there's a lot of iteration here to get the actual image you want. Coming back to your previous point about producing images, like the amount of images that I've produced that end up a bit crap because it's tried to put text in them. Mm, and it's yeah. like, how am I supposed to crop the text out of that? And you end up, depending on the tool you're using, you're trying to use one of the like um, repair tools where you can actually select a bit of the image and do another generation. And it's almost like you needed actually to generate images deliberately without text in and then try and add it later. And not only is that a bit of a pain in the bottom from a from a workflow perspective, um, it actually cuts down also on the creative possibilities, right? Like I remember the one of the first things I did was I tried to get Dolly 2 to create a new logo for Bystrar just to see what it would look like. And it was horrific. Like it didn't understand at all. It couldn't get the word in at all. So you could imagine how this might be applied very quickly to something like logo generation, right? Whereas where we're often in, going to be including the company name and stuff in there. Um, so yeah, no, I think it's going to be fun to play with. I think having had a play with it, I see this again as like fairly early. I think it will yeah. get better from here. But but yes, I think it solves one of the problems that we've all been having. Right. Uh, last story and then a quick tool of the week. So... This is a quick one. Um, we saw this on the Twitters this week, Martin, didn't we? Somebody made a whole trailer for an anime movie using text to video using Runway ML's Gen 2. It's about two minutes long and it is incredible. Like, when was Gen 2 even released? Like, what, two weeks ago or something? I don't know. Yeah, two or three weeks. It's no time at all. Gen 1 which was the, the precursor to Gen 2, makes a lot of sense, um, where you could... It the, was, how, how do they come up with this? Honestly, they must have, invention. that must have been an incredible four-hour workshop <laughs> to figure out how they were going to get that to work. But the, um, yeah, Gen 1, I think, was you made a video and then he basically stylized it. But now this is just text-based. And we, we thought it was amazing. Um, you should check it out. Search for, I don't know, anime, movie, runway, Gen 2. You'll probably find it. We'll share a link and we'll embed it on the uh, on the website. Let's do that. Why don't we help yeah. the people out? We'll embed it on the Give website. Them Check what out the they website. Need. God, get, go to artificiallyintelligentmarketing.com, which I hope is the actual name of the website. Because uh, Martin's the <laughs> master of that domain. It sounds like it probably is. Go there. You'll see it there. But um, one of the things that's kind of interesting about it is it's full of crazy artifacts. Like there's a... A, a quick scene where in the city where a car is driving along the road and it just disappears into the road and is never seen completely again. becomes the road. Yeah, it's kind of mad. There's a character stood at a bar, um, like a like a desktop doing some work, and they've only got one leg. Um, and so this is far away from being production quality. But if you think about where we were like a month ago in terms of, oh, you can generate images and... Um, they're kind of a bit photorealistic, but people's fingers are a bit weird. Now we've got Mid Journey version 5, which has fixed a lot of those issues. And now we've got text to video of the point where someone could create an anime movie trailer. We're back to that exponential speed of development and how we're supposed to get our heads around it, mine. It did feel watching it, it was a bit like watching a Studio Ghibli film on acid. Yeah. Yeah, it gave me a nosebleed a bit. I don't disagree with you because um, of the bits that were hazing in and out. Um, but the person who put it together, applause. Um, yeah, I suspect, yeah, top marks. I suspect it took 
ages, just from our experience playing with image and video generation tools, 99 times out of 100, no, maybe that's too many, but nine times out of 10, you don't get what you want. So iterating every single one of those scenes until the person got what they wanted was probably a labor of love. Um, but as this technology progresses mar for marketers, how is text to video going to impact your marketing strategy, right? In terms of how accessible video becomes and how you might turn to video for certain campaigns or content that you want to create where video would have been too time consuming or perhaps expensive, um, especially animation-y type video, where obviously I think this is, is sitting, you now can turn to it. And maybe you can even create pretty good quality uh, video at scale for things like your social media programs. And then there's little bits of B-roll footage that you want to just stick on a social post. Yeah, that's that's where I can see this being really useful. Absolutely. And I think if we look at second order consequences, and this is probably true for all the tools, as they start to become more mainstream in terms of use, it's the creativity of the idea and its ability to be interesting to your audience, to disrupt their attention and, and grab their attention. That's what becomes the premium and that's the human part. So I think when we end up with easier access to tools that can produce a high quality output, the cream that will rise to the top is the people who think of really excellent creative ideas to drive the machine and have the creative eye and the tenacity to keep prompting it to get closer mm -hmm. to the thing that they actually want to see. Yeah, these these outputs are never just a, a one-shot done, there we go. <laughs> I've created the masterpiece I had in my mind. It's always a constant iteration, tweaking, refining. Um, but yeah, the, the, I think that, that that's ultimately going to be the, the role of the AI artist. Um, it's iterating, improving, and... and prompt engineering hey i think so and i think we'll um i think we'll see i think we'll see those people really rise to the fore in fact there's um I, I met a gent this week called chris branch who's doing some really interesting work using generative creative tools to produce really stunning stuff um and i connected with him on linkedin and you should all look him look him up um sharing so many creative approaches to image generation to really open it really opened my mind to just how important the creative person is in getting inspirational arresting provocative things out of the tools i've seen um from him different animals like fish and things like leaping out of sands i think they took sand shark as an inspiration and then riffed on that with a bunch of other animals and these images are incredible right they are borderline photorealistic certainly all the elements are it's just your brain is like well i know that's not real right and i and i think about a lot of the work on creative campaigns that i've done where the gifted creative has come up with that idea and then had to execute it by seamlessly blending two three five more images in something like photoshop to get that effect but they're getting that out of mid journey presumably iteratively so not in one minute but maybe in 15 oh, it's pretty cool and pretty inspiring so we're going to get chris i had a chat with chris um last week we're going to get chris on the on the website because i think he'd tell us some really fantastic stories about that but but hopefully this you can find that video online everyone it will inspire you to think about where video is heading and what creative ideas that you have that now you can have realized and and also maybe if you look up chris branch on linkedin and see some of the things that they're doing What's the name of Chris's company? Where is he working? I think it's Seedily. Maybe I'll put that in the show notes and not try and check that in real time. But yeah, and be inspired. Go have a play. You can probably do some really cool stuff with just a bit of patience and Googling around to get some advice on how to come up with prompts. And I know that Chris and his team actually offer mid-journey training as well for people who want to get some insights into how they achieve what they achieve. So that's that's worth looking into. Right, one last bits and piece, and then we'll be all done for the week. Tool of the week this week is, it's a strange one, probably doesn't sound like much of a tool, but I've been playing with it this week, and I think I think I'm gonna change my behavior quite a lot based on it Ooh. it is um it's 
not particularly new, although it's relatively new. I think it came out in maybe mid-March. So for users of Edge, the browser from Microsoft, of which I was not one, I have been a Chrome user for many, many, many years, um, you can now access the Bing chatbot in the sidebar. And actually, as, as much as it gives you access to a lot of the things that you can access through Bing when you go to the chatbot thing, which includes a lot of chat GPT-like tools, like um, creating copy, writing blog, blog posts, summarizing things, all with the power of the ability to actually browse the web, which for those of us who don't have the access to that plugin within chat GPT yet, is a great way to start experimenting with how that functionality might work for you by using Bing. But you can use it in the sidebar. Where did this get a bit ninja for me was when I was inspired to try some of the tools within there by opening up Google Drive files like Google Docs and also um, OneDrive files like Microsoft Word documents, both of which obviously you can do in the browser. Now you can select text in those documents and you can click a button and it pushes it instantly into the Bing sidebar, which you've got open side by side. And then you get a bunch of options, like you can ask it to explain the text, revise the text, summarize the text, or expand the text. And why I thought this was cool is, in essence, this is like a mini preview of what Copilot, Microsoft Copilot might be like, right? So for those of you that do a lot of editing in the browser, if you're doing it in Edge, you can actually now start to edit your emails and your text in your documents that you're writing and you can tap into some of this generative AI power. Um, from the play that I've had, it's very text driven. So it doesn't appear to have any of those upgrades from the co-pilot launch video in terms of you can't manage data or do anything cool in Excel. And I don't think you can particularly do anything easily in, I think it does image generation. Does it do in? Uh, you can do image generation, but I don't know if you can do it within, say, the PowerPoint environment. No, I think no, it's, you can't. It's no. almost like it's, more it's like a, limited to the Edge environment. Isn't yeah, it? it's kind of like a Dolly type prompt to get yourself mm, yeah. an image. Um, fascinating, nonetheless. We talked about what this would do to the Google ecosystem a couple of weeks ago, and I seem to remember us coming to the conclusion that getting people to change their behaviour and move from one system to another would be quite hard. But if they added enough value, then you might. I'm seriously having to think about binning all of the ecosystem I've built for myself in Chrome. I've got all these lovely plugins and all this other stuff and move into Edge because I want access to this power now. And to my understanding, other than third-party tools that I could install as Chrome plugins that, if I'm honest, I don't, don't entirely trust because I don't know where my information is going. Like, what if I'm working on a sensitive internal project here at Vistra? I don't necessarily want to highlight a piece of text, send it off through a third-party tool where the third-party pro provider gets to see it. Um, and I have more trust in Microsoft, right? <laughs> Wrongly, right? But we've talked previously as well about how one of the valuable parts of their ecosystem is to appeal to enterprise and have that level of security and data management within it. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about going to Edge so that I can get this power. I've been playing with it for a few weeks and I have it open. I have two browsers open at any given time. Now, I ditched Chrome a while ago. I find it a bit of a resource hog. But um, I have Vivaldi, which is my daily driver. And I have on my second screen, Edge with... Uh, the other day, I found myself in the absurd situation where I had Bard open on my main chat with a sidebar of Bing chat with Claude by Anthropic on my main screen in Vivaldi. And I was jumping between the three of them, putting in different prompts, trying to get the best outputs. But uh, yeah, as a, as a tool just integrated into something that's just always there having it in the sidebar is really neat it's so convenient and it does give i mean it's got gpt4 it gives high quality outputs i love the um the compose option as well again as with all ai tech at the moment i think the big developments are really coming out in the ui you know how easy do they make it to for the end user and microsoft have done a good job with that by saying, hey, look, you can 
have a chat with us in the chat mode but if you click on the compose mode you can write a blog post and do you want a small medium or long blog post yeah that compose window is cool do you know how long the long is so to speak because um, i've never i haven't played with it in enough detail to say so i did one um i was doing a live demo with uh, a group the other day and it came out at around 700 800 words for for the long okay i think in general i'm finding my generation needs a a more than that um which i think is one of the things that's put me off the bing ecosystem as well and i probably still use chat gpt4 for, for that for that reason but um yeah okay i i think it's definitely things something to play with on your multiple tabs i mean yeah i'm i think you've got a a software problem Honestly, I, bear mind. I have a problem. They tried to make him go to rehab and he said, no, no, no. And, and need... he asked Chat GPT whether he should go and how he should deal with his addiction. <laughs> and he found that the therapist yeah. was very empathetic. <laughs> and no, gave he didn't. He, Chat advice. GPT said, I'm not a trained therapist. I can't possibly <laughs> advise you. And so then so he, he jailbroke it instead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then it gave him all the goods. And it was like, yeah. It's no hope for you, Martin. I've been watching you and I've been looking at all your prompts and you can't try and give out. You'll never be able to just embrace the darkness. Um, some of that might be true, but most of it's probably junk. Um, cool. So that's Tool of the Week. Go and have a play with the Bing sidebar if you haven't, because it's kind of um, very interesting and in how it might augment your work and make actually a few things all in one place a bit easier. Um, I think that's it from us this week, Martin. Was there anything else you wanted to... Share with the lovely folks at home. I just want to make everyone aware that Derby County play Sheffield Wednesday this weekend. Final game of the season. If we win, we're in the playoffs. If we draw and Peter Brewer don't beat Barnsley by three goals to nil, we're in the playoffs. It's all to play for. Come on, you Rams. Let's have it. I love the fact you've shared that, like all of the listeners don't already know. Like, Derby County, for our listenership, is the new Wrexham. Like, they want to know <laughs> when the Disney Plus series is coming out. I desperately want you to get in the playoffs because we all know that the most Derby County thing that Derby County can do is lose the playoffs 2-1, uh, having been 1-0 up in the 89th minute. I, I I, would predict, I'd put money on that happening, honestly. And then we can, I can tease you about it. I will weep into my GPT-powered therapist's <laughs> arms. Don't worry, you can just get another AI software subscription to play with and you'll forget all about it. Right, that's quite enough absolute nonsense for one week. We hope you've all enjoyed this. If you have, please subscribe. If you have other marketers that you know and, they, and you think that they may benefit even from a little bit of this, even though there's a lot of inane chatter in it, please do share it with them as well. We really appreciate it. If you've got any feedback, please hit us up on the Twitters or the LinkedIn. We'd love to hear it. If there's topics you'd like us to feature, let us know. If there's ninja applications of, mar of AI and marketing that you've read about or seen, share them with us. We want to see them. We'd love to hear what you've got to, got to say. Anybody who's doing cool stuff with AI and wants to come on the podcast as an interviewee, we'd love to hear from you as well. Just, um, yeah, just get in touch with us, really. We'd love to hear from you. Have a lovely week, everyone, and we will catch up with you next week. Cheers, Martin. Cheers, bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Artificially Intelligent Marketing. To stay on top of the latest trends, tips, and tools in the world of marketing AI, be sure to subscribe. We look forward to seeing you again next week.